Joining me now is former head of the British Army, Lord Dannett. Uh, Lord Dannett, thank you so much for joining us here on Talk TV. Um, this is this is a bit of a change from Biden because we were hearing from him last week significant language about an arms, potential arms embargo against Israel for the continuation of the war against Hamas in Gaza. And, uh, and quite a lot of people around the world saying this is language we haven't heard from the US before, not being so supportive of Israel in relation to that conflict. Fast forward seven days, significant and imminent threat from Iran, and America is back by their side, aren't they? Yes, you're right. Um, I mean, I think, well, I think every, all observers would recognise that what's going on in Gaza is very complex and very difficult at the present moment, and it's hard to take uh, a particular position. The United States is, yes, of course, it's the steadfast ally of Israel, but must be feeling uncomfortable like everybody else is feeling uncomfortable at the very large number of casualties that have been caused in Gaza, mm. which causes these um, different messages to come out. But I think the uh, intervention by uh, Israel to attack the Iranian consulate and probably kill at least one, if not more, senior commanders, again, changes the, the situation somewhat uh, and seems to have brought Biden back rather more uh, in support of, of Israel. But it's a complex situation and quite difficult for anyone to have a, a singular, consistent message. Of course, Hamas is a terrorist organisation and Gaza is a very small, small place, as we all know from the coverage of that conflict. Iran is a nation state and actually quite a, a big regional player. And I guess that may be the reason that America has been so forceful in this. But of course, America isn't on its own. We've seen uh, Russia and Qatar and the UAE calling for a de-escalation of this conflict. Is, is there a wider global concern if Iran comes into a conflict with Israel that we will see the conflict spread more widely across the Middle East? Well, I think there's a wider regional concern and there is a wider global concern. I think the, the wider regional factor is that uh, Iran balancing all the factors, it's not in Iran's interest to get into a major spat with the West and particularly a major spat with the United States at the present moment. Now, we know that Iran effectively sponsors Hamas, it sponsors Hezbollah, it sponsors the Houthis. So Iran is in a position where it can dial this up or it can dial it down. And although it was making extremely noise, loud noises uh, of protest about the Israeli strike on the consulate uh, uh, that um, took out some senior leaders quite recently, it's not in their interest to promote a, a wider war in the Middle East at the present moment. And of course, the, the global issue, and um, I think I'm right in saying that um, the Japanese president or prime minister is currently visiting the United States. Uh, Japan is showing its support uh, in the wider Far East region to the United States and encouraging the United States to maintain its world leadership position. So there are, there are many issues relating to the Far East, the Middle East, and of course, we're not talking about Ukraine at the present moment, but that is from a British point of view, a United Kingdom point of view, that's frankly the crocodile nearest our canoe. Uh, we heard from David Cameron criticising the Republican Party, uh, particularly saying that they're blocking this aid package to Ukraine, talking about an isolationist USA. Biden here clearly is, is going out of his way to demonstrate the fact that the USA still regards itself as a, a global superpower and a police officer of the world. Do you think that will change if we see a Trump victory in the presidential elections later this year? Well, there's always a tendency towards that. I mean, if we remember when uh, Trump was last in power, it was he who uh, negotiated bilaterally with the Taliban that the United States would uh, exit Afghanistan. And frankly, the rest of us had to come out uh, on the coattails of the United States. So, yes, Trump has got a track record of are tending towards that traditional isolationist view of the United States. But the United States has to realize that it is the world's one superpower, notwithstanding Russia trying to make noises and um, um, doing what Russia is doing in Ukraine, notwithstanding the fact that China is trying to increase uh, its military capability. The United States is still the world's superpower. And frankly, coming back to where I was suggesting a moment or two ago, the blocking of the $60 billion package for Ukraine uh, frankly, is an outrage. And mm. it's the Republican Party in the thrall to Donald Trump that is still holding it up 
And frankly, without that aid coming through, the Ukrainians are now pushed onto the back foot and we could see a serious reverse, which is definitely not in the interests of Western Europe and not in our interests either. And clearly not in the interest of the United States of America either. I think David Cameron, Lord Cameron, made that clear when he was over there. Um, closer to home, Keir Starmer is visiting the BAE submarine factory in Barrow and Finesse uh, today, restating the Labour Party's commitment both to the nuclear deterrent and to defence spending more generally. Is this welcome news? As if, as we believe likely, looking at the polls, Keir Starmer is going to be our next Prime Minister? Well, it would be a major policy shift for any of our, either of our major political parties to move away from the nuclear deterrent and the commitment to continuous at sea deterrence. So uh, it's not surprising that um, visiting Barrow and Furness today, he is uh, really committing Labour to the nuclear deterrent. And if I read it correctly, he talks about a generational commitment. So this is a, an ongoing thing. And of course, he's reached back into history and said, it was in a Labour government that the nuclear deterrent was started. So that's an unsurprising commitment, but it's still a welcome one. I think the more interesting uh, comment from him is his commitment to 2.5% of GDP to be spent on defence when conditions allow, which, of course, is mirroring what Jeremy Hunt said in the spring budget. So what we're seeing here now is a little bit of a bidding war uh, and defence getting itself more into the political agenda and perhaps into the party's manifestos for the general election. So both parties are now committing to 2.5% when conditions are right. I'm watching to see who's going to go up to 3%, because frankly, that's where we ought to be uh, if we're serious about playing our role within NATO and playing our role with facing down Russia. OK, well, one of the areas in which we are seeing significant investment is in the Royal Navy. I was pleased to see today that they have a new weapon, which is a, a laser beam that will be available in 2027 to shoot down drones. Is this the way... Uh, sort of warfare is going with the increasingly high-tech weapons like this and, of course, the increasing use of drones, as we've seen in the Ukraine? Well, it's where aspects of warfare is going. Of course, uh, warfare changes as technologies develop, as new technologies come in, and defence capability has to move that way as fast as it can. But, and this is the expensive but, as far as chancellors and secretaries of state for defence are concerned, just because we're moving towards new technologies doesn't mean that some of the older, more traditional ways of warfare are still not required. Um, just look at the very brutal activity that's going on on land in Ukraine. It's old fashioned gutter fighting with trench and bayonet and grenade, albeit underneath a very active umbrella of drones and counter drone, drone technology. I mean, the analogy which many of us have used many times is just because you've got a snazzy new driver in your golf bag with a carbon fibre shaft, it doesn't mean to say you can bin the old five iron. I'm afraid um, some of the traditional capabilities are still required to, com to complement uh, and increase the overall capability that new technologies bring in. Lord Dana, thank you so much for joining us. That was a fascinating uh, analogy there. Good luck getting back to the golf course. Keep working. Keep, keep working on that handicap. Still with me is Scarlett Maguire and Charlie Rowley. Charlie, um, just I, I'm really interested by this laser beam story. I don't know if you've seen it it's in the Telegraph. They're rushing out a la sort of Star Wars style uh, laser beam weapon to combat drones. Are we going to see much more of this from the defence industry, these, these new weapons coming forward, do you think? Um, I think we will, and I think that's why the, some of the um, uh, spending and commitments were sort of shifted towards addressing sort of uh, technology and sort of fights with intelligence and in, in, in intel and communications. But when you have um, a, a situation like a drone, uh, you've also got the old-fashioned techniques um, that uh, uh, Lord Dana was just talking about, um, like a Chinese spy balloon, which doesn't take much technology at all, but it was something that went way under the radar well, of all they, of us. Uh... They...